Okay, Mr. Mc Professor McKnight, um, we were about to talk about the project that you undertook for a number of years for uh, codification or legislation in the family law arena. What was, uh, that started in 65 or when did that start for you? Actually, it started a few years earlier than it had become a sort of official undertaking of the state bar. Um, it began in 63 or 64, and, and uh, uh, Eugene Smith, who had been one of my students in my first teaching of the course in matrimonial property here at SMU, um, had become one of my colleagues here on the faculty. And we both, uh, we both taught the subject. Uh, we, we traded back and forth. He would teach in the day and I in the evening and vice versa. Um, and uh, we, we talked about it all the time. Um, and we, we both became uh, uh, very, uh, uh, very irritated with trying to teach, teach it in a logical fashion, which uh, a subject which was not, uh, not very logical. That is the case law and the, and the statutes went off in different directions and sometimes nothing at all. What kind of statutory framework existed prior to this? Uh, ju just, just particular, uh, particular sections in, in those, uh, uh, those parts of the revised code of 1925 that began in the 4600s, uh, just one after the other, divorce statutes and uh, some property statutes and some uh, revisions of the law of 1913 uh, when uh, Texas um, w was really the first of, of all of the uh, community property states uh, to set up what was a, a modernized system in 1913, that is to divide the management of the, of the property between husband and wife. Not quite like it is today, but it was a start. Now, there, there was an era of American law called the uh, Married Women Protection Act, uh, there was a period, it seems, when states were... Were P Married Women's Property Acts. Uh, Married the, Women the, Property Acts? Pro it, yes. They the, were changing the law from the old to the new, at least at that time. What well, in, 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 in both common law and in, in community property states. And what were they attempting to do? Give the wife more... Uh, more authority to, to manage her property. And, uh, and less, less uh, subjugation to, to her husband's will or whim. Do you think uh, it was correlated with any national politics like the suffrage movement or something like that? Or? I, I think the suffrage movement had, had a, a fair amount to do with it. Uh, that is, it, uh, um, the suffrage movement uh, was, was the big element, that is, the women's right to vote. Um, but uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, property, the property revisions also tended to follow the, uh, the, the suffrage movement to some extent. They, after all, they were akin. And were, was there a model that they were, uh, did someone break ground with a new modern way of allocating more power to the women and it became replicated? Well, it, it, was, it, was, it was thought that the, a married woman should have more control over her property, although in, uh, in in I think every community property state, uh, the, the notion that uh, the husband was the principal breadwinner, because there were very few women who, who married women who uh, were, uh, were in business or worked outside the home, um, the, that the, the husband was the principal breadwinner um, and provider for the, for the family. And, uh, but a, a married woman might have a separate property, which she inherited, or received by gift from her parents, uh, and that uh, the notion was that she should have a, a bigger, a bigger part in uh, in managing that as her own, managing which it was her own separate, her but own, not her, managing the community, yet. but not not managing the community. the the first The first uh, change in Texas law came in 1911, uh, when uh, it became possible by statute. For a married woman to have the uh, uh, the disabilities of coverture removed with her husband's consent, and that was permanent, couldn't be revoked. Um, once once that happened, that was uh, I don't recollect that anybody ever tried to revoke it. Okay. But uh, um, that meant she could contract without her husband's consent. Well, t for certain purposes, she couldn't tell, sell securities or land without her husband's consent. Okay. 
but that that notion of course was was essentially for her protection now that was not always the way that uh, it was viewed uh, by the uh, by the more outspoken uh, women's rights uh, people uh, but uh, that that's the way that uh, it was generally thought of, in, in the, not only in the bar, but in the population generally. And do you recall what year the disabilities of coverture were finally removed in Texas? Oh, I th that was, um, I think it was probably 69. Oh, was it? I, I don't remember. Whether I don't know. I thought I remember uh, uh, some legislative activity in 1963. Well, there was some activity in 63. Uh, but whether it was complete or not in '63, I don't I don't remember. But it, there was there was uh, some some significant change in '63. Now then, the uh, codification process or the family law redrafting process that began in about '63 uh, started with you and Professor Smith wanting to rationalize this area of the law. Yes, that that's now. I, I began just on my own uh, drafting some few uh, a few uh, changes that I thought needed to be made, now, and you, that I might ask one of my friends in the legislature if he would introduce it for me. Were you codifying common law holdings, or were you altering statutes at that point? I was doing some of both, and I would uh, I would take them up. To, to, I would walk up to Gene's office. Gene, you know, was uh, was severely crippled from polio, right. uh, and I'd go up to Gene's office and we'd talk about them. And I would, uh, we'd talk about, well, how could we improve on that uh, that provision and talk about it a good deal. And uh, we we worked on on these uh, uh, proposals of ours uh, for um, from about '63 to about '65. Uh, and we were beginning to get things organized, and we talked. I'd been Gene's teacher, and we began talking about how to make the law more sensible. Um, and um, uh, then, then the the bar, you remember, um, had a a a, um, a referendum on the women's rights um, amendment, what we call the Equal Rights Amendment, to be put in the Constitution. Right. Um, Texas Constitution. The Texas Constitution. It was proposed uh, largely by the Business and Professional Women's Club. Um, and they felt very strongly that uh, uh, professional women were being discriminated against uh, and that they needed uh, to uh, a law in the Constitution uh, that they could do anything that uh, any man could do. Um, and uh, especially with respect to property, um, and they, um, um, they 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 had had wanted the legislature to to propose such a constitutional amendment, uh, and this had been going on for several years. And the way it worked was that uh, each each legislative session, one one house would pass it, and the other one would, would reject never, it. Never get it to the floor. It, it would never, never, they vote well, it never get they on. The, they would never get on the ballot. So it would never. They never voted against it, but they never voted it through. They never voted it through. It would be de defeated in one house and proved in the other, and then they would switch, switch the next time around. And this went on for several years. Finally, in in um, in '65, um, I believe it was '65. The, uh, the the legislature, leg various legislators, uh, told the state bar that something was going to have to be done. That uh, they didn't feel they could stand up to the pressure any any longer. That ruse wasn't working anymore. It was not working anymore, and they were going to have to. They were they were losing votes. Um, that um, they um, uh, the state bar had to do something, especially since the state bar kept saying that well, everything that needs to be done can be done by legislation, but no legislation was getting passed. Um, therefore, uh, they uh, they said, what what can we do? We we needed some kind of a statute or something, uh, um, and uh, they they uh, somehow the the word got out that Gene and I had been working on something. Um, and uh, probably women's management rights that may be associated with the idea. Some, of some, some, more some of these changes that we've been drafting up between ourselves. Um, and um, uh, 
the, the president of the state bar, who was Joyce Cox at that time from Houston, called me and said, uh, do, do you have some kind of, are you working on some kind of statute up there um, that has give women, married women, more rights? And I said, yes, Professor Smith and I have been working on something. And he said, well, how about uh, sending that this to us? We need to pass something. And I said, well, it's, it's not ready. Um, it, we're just working on it. And he said, we got to have something right now. Uh, and he said, when, when can you get it to me? And I said, well, I don't know. Uh, give me three weeks. Um, and Gene and I got to work in earnest, and we turned out a draft of something in three weeks. Um, sent it down to, uh, to Cox, who sent it down to uh, one of the senators, uh, and it passed the Senate. Uh, now, was this a statute, or was this, this a... a statute? This All is right. a statute. Um, it, um, it then uh, died in the House. Uh, at the end of the session. What did it accomplish? For, fortunately, what, what because it was not really ready to be passed anywhere. Uh, what, did, what did you and Professor Smith try to uh, legislate? Well, the, um, to, uh, to make it clear what the rights were of the parties, and we were maintaining all the old numerations, same sections with, with new provisions and changed provisions. Uh, but we were trying to put it in the same structure as it existed then in those, those sections in the, in the 4,400 sections of the revised statutes of 25. Were the wife's management rights in parity with the husband or were they still inferior under that? They were, they were, they were still in, in, inferior but a great deal more in parity uh, right. than they had been before. Uh, simply because uh, um, the... Uh, they didn't want them to be in parity completely. So what happened then after the bill died in the legislature? Well, um, uh, Luis Raggio was one of the, uh, fortuitously, was uh, the, the president of the family law section. Of the State Bar of Texas? Of the State Bar of Texas, which and was new. She's a Dallas family lawyer? Yes. Was she a family lawyer she, then? She was a family lawyer. And, um, um, and to have a, a woman as chairman was a help. Uh, because uh, uh, she she uh, wanted to move the thing along, and she um, she had been working. On, she, she Louise probably testified before the legislature in um, in 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 uh, before the Senate in '65. I'm not sure whether she did or not, but I think she did. Um, and. Um, uh, we can we we have all those files. We can find it, the whole history of it there if anybody wants to look. Where are they kept? No, oh, they're kept over there in in the attic of the where my office is. Here in the room uh, next to us? No, over there in the other building. In the faculty office a, building. A, a, in the office building. Uh, but I have the whole thing there. Every well, every let's every be sure every, that the, every scrap of paper that's left over from it. Let's be sure that the custodial staff doesn't discard that sometimes. Well, I hope they haven't, but I don't think they have. Every once in a while, the fire marshal does get after us for and to clean it up up there. Maybe uh, at some point we ought to move that over to some safe. I, I place. think it perhaps ought to go to the family law section. Um, but uh, yes, I do. I do have it all. Um, so anyway, uh, died in the legislature, so the 67th uh, session Lu is coming Lu Louise, around. Louise, Louise prevailed upon Clint Small from Austin, who had then become the president of, of the state bar, um, to, uh, to, to continue this, that uh, we've got some momentum going. Now, let's, let's get this thing rolling along and, and uh, not just make lip service, we'd get something done. Um, and um, almost uh, by accident, the state bar became a party to law reform hmm. in this area. And Clint said yes, that he would, he would cooperate, although I don't know how serious he was about it, but Louise was very serious about it. Um, and, and we got it, got it moving along. So you and uh, Professor Smith redrafted? We redrafted it and began working with a group of the uh, uh, members of the family law section, a, a committee of the family law section. Would that be the family law council, the governing body? Or no, it was, a, it, was a, it was a special group that was appointed 
for this particular purpose of law reform. And uh, uh, since we were mainly working on family property law, um, uh, Bill Huey and Bill Fritz from the University of Texas are on the committee. Uh, Gene and I from, from here, uh, Dean McSwain from Waco, from Baylor. Um, Dick Amandes, I think, was uh, then uh, uh, dean at, uh, at the new Texas Tech Law School. Uh, and um, was he on your committee? He was on. I think he was on the committee, and maybe and maybe somebody else from from well, Texas Tech. Was there anybody there that wasn't a professor? Um, yeah, I think there were there were several other other uh, just practicing lawyers. Judges? Uh, no judges. And there were some. As time went on, there were some judges. Uh, there was a, a, a judge from a judge from Austin, a judge from San Antonio, um, Judge McKay. Patrick McKay? No. Um, no, James McKay. James McKay. James McKay. Um, and um, uh, there, there, were, there was a, another, a judge from Houston. Um, so the, there, were, there were judges and, and lawyers and some academics. The judge from Houston, do you recall? Wasn't Judge Emerson, was it? It was not, no. Uh, Judge Emerson came on later, but he he but it was not uh, it was not Judge Emerson initially. Uh, and you all met uh, several several times we, a year. We many? met several times a year. We met seemed to me was almost continuously. Were you rewriting just marital property statutes? We were just rewriting marital property statutes at first, and that that, that this is leading up to the statute which was presented to the legislature in '67, hmm. and we. Uh, um, that that went went through um, seven full drafts with a commentary of every section in the committee process. In the committee process, and we we hammered those things out time and time again. We met sometimes here. We met sometimes at Austin. We met sometimes uh, um, down at Waco. I don't remember ever having met at Lubbock, but maybe we did. Uh, but we would we met. Uh, all over, uh, wherever was seemed convenient for everybody. Um, uh, we, we probably met at Houston uh, once or twice, I don't remember, but we mainly seemed to, to meet here in Austin most of the time. But I'm sure we met at Baylor some, sometime or other. Now, was the Equal Rights Amendment moving along a separate track, or was well, it part of equal, your project? Well, the Equal Rights Amendment continued to be, to be uh, offered but everyone managed to convince everyone else that well we're we're do we're dealing with that, uh, so we, we give us a chance to get this finished, and then you'll see that. <clears throat> and the penal code was being revised because those were the two sensitive areas: family property law and the penal code to the Equal Rights Amendment. That is, um, on the penal side, the sex crimes were what was going to throw everything out of gear. And in the family law, it was the, the family property law. Uh, if we could just get those uh, handled by statute, we figured that we could, we could let the, the, the Equal Rights Amendment pass, as it did in 72. I mean, so nobody objected to its being passed in 72. In the penal code, the sex crimes were always uh, the woman is the victim. So if equal rights came in, it would create a, a tension with the well, and, the and 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 uh, um, and and rape uh, was also a you know it, it's it's certainly not usually even thought of uh, uh, academically as it, it, a, a man is the person who's raping in the, in the traditional common law sense. Um, so that that had to be all of that had to be ironed out. And you felt like if you ironed it out first, it would make it easier for the amendment. Well, we could, and it just sailed through. Nobody objected to it that, that it, when it was put on the ballot in '72. Well, proved to be right. But you, you were, uh, you were breaking hard ground with the work you were doing long before the Equal Rights Amendment ever passed. Oh yes, and and before it, it, it was never, it never even got on the ballot until until it was until it was passed in '72. That is so it, back to the marital property law. Um, the 63 legislature, it had died. The 65 legislature was... I don't think it ever got to the... Well, I don't think it got to the legislature until 65. And that's it died there, and then 
Louise Raggio got behind it, and then by the 67 well, she got the she got the state bar behind it. Um, Louise always, always said that she talked some people into it when they'd had a little bit too much to drink. Okay. <laughs> this is leading up to the 67 legislature. And by this time, your committee had been meeting a dozen times or more. Yes. And you had a work product. And we, we, we had point. a work product which we thought was suitable for, for presenting. And so it went to Austin as, a, as one bill that amended all these different that, statutes? That's right. As far as we wanted to, or felt like we could go. Was it only marital property? It was only marital property. You didn't work the penal code side. Oh, no, no. That was what Paige Keaton and his committee were working on. And so uh, do you recall who your sponsors were in that session? Um, uh, J.P. Word from Meridian uh, was the sponsor in the Senate. Uh, and Jean... What is that man's name? Was the sponsor in the House? I, I can look it up for you. Um, his first name was Gene, and yeah. he 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 was he was very pleased with it. Said it was the best piece of legislation that uh, that he had ever had anything to do with, uh, as far as uh, that it it was well thought through. Was uh, it controversial in the legislature? Um, oh, so, some some things were. But uh, we got it. We got it passed. Did the bill pass with all component parts? We they took one one part out, um, and that was the that, that was the, <clears throat> the, the the part about gifts. Um, that is, uh, uh, to what extent could a spouse make a gift of uh, of community property? Well, that's an unanswered question, even to and, this day. And and that. <laughs> well, we shouldn't have had the vision in there, and it was the, I thought the legislature showed great wisdom in taking it out. <laughs> it's a question that's never been answered. Okay, so um, it passed, signed by the governor, and it became effective then, presumably in September of 1960. No, January the 1st of, 70, of, 70, of, of 68. 68. And uh, what was the reception, if any? Was the bar or the public aware that well, the they, law had they, We'd, we'd thought about that in advance. That we, we've got to educate the bar on this. Um, that is, we weren't so much concerned with the, with the, with the public. I mean, we had to educate the bar on, uh, on what, what had been done uh, so that they would, they would learn. Uh, and as some older lawyer said, you've repealed my legal education. You've just changed everything. <laughs> Actually, it wasn't as changed as they thought. It was just that they didn't know what the rules were already. Um, but I think we did a pretty good job. Now then, that 1967 act that came out, were there any uh, education, continuing education courses that existed at the time to advise lawyers, or how did you get the word out about the changes? Yes, that, that we did. The, the family law section did, did sponsor a whole series of, um, uh, in various parts of the state, uh, uh, CLE, uh, programs. That's got to be some of the very first CLE that... It was had. some of the very first first CLE and those programs grew. Now were they, um, were there other areas of the law that had CLE going on at the time or was family law it? Well I expect there were a few others. Um, I don't know what they were but we could we could look in the bar journals and find that easily enough. And what kind of venues? Were these lectures at law schools? No, they were they were big lectures in uh, um, sometimes sometimes in law schools. Uh, sometimes though, we found that law school didn't have enough facility to. So you uh, go to a hotel, or so would we'd, you go to we'd an have it have it at a hotel. Okay. And or uh, or at you know at the at the bar convention. Some of these were at bar conventions. Uh, you could have them in a in a really big big place. Did you have written materials? And and, and written materials and lectures. And lectures. Did you have a series of different people lecturing? Um, the it usually was the it usually was the same people who would appear in in different places. But on on a particular day, there would be the first speech would be given by one person and the second by another. Yes. And you would cover the whole area by the end of the day. Yes, and and the and those early uh, um, th those early. The brochures, the the written, the printed parts, they had a picture of a of a man, obviously a husband, at the ironing board, hmm. uh, whereas his wife was doing something, you know, important, like at a desk. Okay. <laughs>
So uh, <laughs> now, that was a road show that went around. Were you involved in that? Yes, we, we gave Smith and we, others? Yes, we gave we gave these things all over. And uh, the various members of the committee were among those who gave the gave the lectures. Now then, uh, building on this foundation, there was an effort then in the next legislative session to codify husband-wife relations. In 69, How yes. did that occur uh, now that you had this legislative accomplishment behind you on marital property law to expand that to include the whole of husband-wife A family relations. code. Well, Title I of the family code. Yes, Title I of you the family code. You moved away from modif modifying the old uh, almost happenstance black statutes to yes. replace it with a codification not just of marital property, but all husband and wife relations. That is the whole thing as a family code. We've talked about family code, but we were doing just the property part first. How did you all go then from the success you had of revising the marital property statutes forward to a codification process that expanded out? Well, it was just decided that that's what we ought to do. And, and who is we? The family law section. That is the council of the family law section. Okay, so what did they do to accomplish that? Raise some money. Yeah. Uh, and we got money from, uh, uh, from the Hoblet Cell Foundation um, and uh, another couple of foundations. Uh, I think we started out maybe with uh, uh, twenty-five or $50,000 uh, total. Was that used to, uh, to defray the travel defray expenses? the travel and hotel expenses of the various people involved? And this was a committee appointed by the and and I council? paid for a secretary. We we had to have a secretary here who would prepare all the materials for the uh, um, uh, for for the the day to day work on what we what we were doing. Now the 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 CLE part I think was the, that those that, that part was produced in Austin. That is the the course uh, the course materials. And the secretary was here at SMU School of Law. Yes. yes. Now then, um, was the committee a committee of the family law section? Yes. And can you remember? And we had we had we had three or four committees. We had the property committee, we had the marriage and divorce committee, we had the children and custody committee, custody and support. And then we had a, a, a fourth committee uh, made up of uh, a variety of other things, uh, uh, matters uh, that were peripheral. And we saved one principal fourth part for the, the problems of the, of the elderly, which we never did. Uh, the way that, had been, that was planned as, as, uh, as chapter four of the family code initially was to be for elderly people. Uh, Maybe we had, a, you know, the, the peripheral stuff was uh, adoption uh, and other other things involving how about children. Name change, yes. Uh, disability name change, and the, of disability. All the, yeah. Do you recall who the chair of the property committee was? Um, mm, I don't know whether I I don't know that I was the chair. I think I was just the principal worker. Okay. Uh, I don't remember who the who the chair the, the chair was, but each 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 one of these had a separate chair. I forget who the who it was. Did you serve only on the property committee? Well, I also had sort of general administrative chores. So uh, yes, I only served on the property committee. I was an academic advisor to the property committee. Do you recall the chairs of any the chair? Of the chair of the property committee was probably Dean McSwain at Waco. And do you recall any of the early members, sir, the during that period when you were writing Title I of the Family Code, any of the property committee members? No, but we can easily find all that out by just looking at the, f at looking at the files. And um, do you know the leadership of any of the other committees? Um, I, I, I don't remember because some of them also became the section chairman from time to time. Um, I remember Orberly Malone from um, El Paso uh, was was one. Um, Dean McSwain was another. Um, Everett Lord uh, or Beaumont. And Beaumont was was one. Um, they were from all over the state. 
Uh, I would have to refresh my recollection by just getting out all those names. Was Luis Raggio on any? Louise, of Louise was, Louise was part of the of the of the property group. Okay. Um, and she became chair also. Now then, um, <clears throat> you were able, you collectively were able to get this work 